Mo Golden and you're watching Art Kitchen. I'm here with Robin Lansong, a visionary artist, craniosacral therapist, and practitioner of singing medicine and author. Robin is currently working on a memoir recounting her abduction from the U.S. as a child and her near-death experience in Rhodesia during the Rhodesian Bush War. Audiences at conferences, universities, and in the Olympia community where she lives are mesmerized by Robin's presence, her resilience, poise, and deep connection to life and to death. You can learn more about Robin and follow along with the progress of her upcoming book at robinlansong.com. This is the second of a two-part interview, so make sure you check out both. So talking about death and a lot of your work has to do with death. You have a book that you're working on right now um, that's a memoir about dying and coming back to life. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I'm especially interested in hearing about your creative process of working, your experience of working on that book. Mm -hmm. So I have been working on that for close to seven years. In January, it'll be seven years. And it's a little bit like having a child. I had no idea what I was getting into. And it's good, because I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> so I had been working on another book, kind of, I, I was an avid journal writer and was uh, making a book of my recovery process from severe abuse in the U.S. And I also had an experience where I was, um, when I was eight years old, I was uh, abducted and I was taken from the U.S. and the abductor took me to uh, Rhodesia. And well, once we arrived, he um, hired somebody else to be a caretaker of me and um, the person and basically ended up leaving me behind. And so I was separated from the abductor, which was great, um, but I was also alone. And so here I am, this eight-year-old white girl, suddenly in, in the bush of, uh, I think it was, on, it was on the border of Rhodesia, and it, we're still kind of researching exactly where I might have been. I might have been just crossing to Botswana. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happened is that I um, ended up getting picked up by uh, some soldiers, which I thought were, I thought that was going to be the end of my life right there. I thought I was going to be shot. Um, but they were neutral soldiers, and they took me, um, I think, to a safer area. Mm. And basically, it dropped me off, kind of pointed towards the village and said, <laughs> you know, in their language, go there, little girl. Mm -hmm. And I was too scared to go to the village, so I spent the night um, outside and uh, I was just doing talking to somebody about it today and he said people have said oh you're really lucky you're out in the bush you didn't get eaten by a hyena or something and he and the person was reflecting back well, well it's all divine order you must have been protected mm. and fortunately I didn't even know enough to be scared about what was there yeah so the next day I made my way into the village and um, eventually after um, I was very scared of people because I had been so traumatized. Um, but it was really the children that welcomed me in, and they, the, and they gave me food and water. And the children were the ones to take me to the fire circle, and they probably had never seen a white child. And so they covered me in ash to make me black. Uh -huh. And the older girl was telling a story the whole time, and she's kind of the lead storyteller. And now that I've really written the book, I realize she was probably telling the creation story of me arriving in her village. And mm. just that um, many tribal groups will kind of record historic events. So me arriving there... It was a historic event. Yes. And so she was pronouncing the story of how I came. Hmm. And, you know, and by the end, I'm covered in black ash. And it was the most belonging I'd ever felt in my life. Mm. And they were laughing and they had belonging themselves. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy for them to include me. Mm -hmm. And so I went from extreme trauma where my life was threatened to the most amazing belonging in, you know, in a span of hours of each other. Um, the war was um, spilling closer to our village. It was the Rhodesian Bush War. And there was um, many factions of it, but one of them were guerrilla soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so one of their 
tactics to try and get rule was to try and get um, white people out. Mm -hmm. And so they were doing it really by any means necessary. And so they were literally just killing white people on the spot mm -hmm. to try and make it unsafe. Mm -hmm. And so that all the people who had come and settled there would leave. Um, and so I was uh, alone and I was by the river and unfortunately one of the guerrilla, um, a soldier, a truck of guerrilla soldiers went by and they spotted me. And um, so they promptly, I was shot. And the um, bullet grazed the top of my head and that creates a um, tremendous amount of blood loss. And so I began to die of blood loss and shock. And then I crossed over, and this has been the most incredible part of the writing process. It, you know, it started as just like 10 pages, mm -hmm. and I have unpacked it. And, and the, I met five beings on the other side. And at first, my memories around it were really hazy. But the more I committed it to paper, and again, there's that commitment piece, and that courage piece to write it down. And then um, my husband and other people would kind of interview me about well, what would happen here and unpack this and tell me more about this. And, and so now that part is two chapters, so that's 30 pages hmm. of what I experienced when I was on the other side. And, and what I know and what I want to get across to people is that everyone belongs. Everyone gets to come home. No part of anybody is excluded, kind of no matter what you've done. And that there is so much love and it's not even forgiveness because what actions we do are about our learning, even if they are destructive. And that everybody gets to be purified and come home. And so writing this book has brought that back for me and given me the gift again, of what I experienced there. Mm. And then the more I share it with people, again, it's, I, I can't predict the benefits that happen for people. Yeah. I was in a workshop that was about uh, presenting your work in um, poetry form. And so really totally off the cuff, I was reading some of my manuscript and just holding up pieces of my art mm -hmm. and the teacher was encouraging us to do it in singing format. Mm -hmm. So I was singing my manuscript and holding out my pictures and you know this was like only 10 people and I was kind of laughing as I was doing it because it was I was so unprepared and it was just really ad lib and uh, I got done and there was tears streaming down this woman's face and when I asked her what was going on for her she said I had an incredible fear of death and now hearing for you for just three minutes, I don't. Whoa. And I thought, who am I not to do this? Mm -hmm. Who am I not, if I have this to offer, who am I not to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I did a, a larger reading, it was my very first big reading where I read what kind of what I had at the time, that was many years ago. And I, again, I got done the reading and there was one piece where there's um, one being I met who, in my uh, Buddhist language, I would say he's a bodhisattva. He, was, he came to take care of me and help me and guide me through um, kind of the whole realm of purification. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't been there, I would have just kind of stayed there lost. Mm -hmm. And so when I was reading that part of the story, I got so moved with gratitude that I really couldn't speak. Mm, reading that part of your own manuscript? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and I heard a voice inside, and I was trying to, trying to pull it together so I could, you know, appear more, <laughs> you know, I could read this thing. And, and I heard a voice inside, see you so clearly say, give them everything. And so I just let myself be in that overwhelming gratitude I had for him. I'm going to feel it right now. And just let myself cry. And then I got done reading. And again, I looked up and tear streaked faces and everybody was silent and I, I really didn't understand what I had mm -hmm. and what I had opened up. And here's the part I love. People started describing that they had a life review while I was reading my experience. And I thought, great, you get the benefit without having to get shot. Perfect. <laughs> this is way less messy. A little shortcut. <laughs> a little shortcut. <laughs> And at the end of that talk, and people were, like story after story of people were 
realizing they were stronger than I thought mm -hmm. and realizing, oh, that story, I part of my life I've been minimizing. Actually, I was really courageous to make it through that. Mm -hmm. and, and giving themselves credit and giving them, like, restoring their own dignity by, by giving themselves their own story back. Yeah. And at the end of that, I was kind of in a moment of hearing everybody's stories and I had an, an image of another audience and then another audience, another audience, and I thought, and I heard, this is your work. Hmm. And just, again, this gratitude came through me and it felt like divinity made my own heart twice as big so that I could hold a space for people in the audience to do their healing as a group community event. Mm -hmm. And that I could be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Your story is so powerful. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm hearing like again and again in all of these stories that you're telling this piece about having the audience or the viewer finish the puzzle for you. Mm -hmm. And that there's this part for you of like having faith and trusting through a really difficult, uncomfortable process, and then it really coming together and being receiving that validation and that encouragement. But there's some really like rocky, dark roads in there. How do you, how, and you've said, you know, you're saying like stay with it, you know, how do you stay with it? And where, what does that faith feel like before it's validated? Mm, that's a great question. I think in the beginning, of my healing process, I was just in so much pain that I went forward just to get out of that. Mm -hmm. And so in the beginning, it was a motivation of desperation mm -hmm. of, you know, they say this doing therapy and doing these, you know, body work sessions and doing art is helpful to healing trauma. And I'll just do it because I'm not hearing anything else that's saying right. how to get me out of this. Yeah. And, and then I would have, I remember, it was two years into my healing process before I smiled. Mm. I went two years without having enough joy to like, get a crack smile. Ouch. I know. And it was a moment, like I, I drove up to a place where I could watch the sunset. And, I, and it just was peaceful enough that I smiled. Mm. So in the beginning, it was really uh, trying to exit out of the hell I was in. Yeah. <laughs> and I read a um, story by a psychologist who works in prisons. Mm -hmm. And she says when she gets somebody she, to work with who's already in tears or already even angry, she said, now I have something to work with this person. If I have people come in who are totally numb, mm -hmm. totally flat, totally won't take any responsibility for anything, then she has a couple years to work with just getting them unnumb. Right. If she's able to. Because mm -hmm. Because when you're numb, you're not in that much pain. So what's your motivation to get out of it? Right. So I went from, And yeah, walking through that pain is the worst part. Right. So, mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's um, Sweet Honey in the Rock, uh, uh, a cappella women's African-American uh, African group, says, if you want change in your life, walk into the storm. You will be different on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, I've been a tongue on to that motto of, I'm in the storm. I'm walking through and they're saying I'm going to get to another side. And so just getting those tiny moments of, of joy. Like I remember once when I was out and I was dancing and then I had another authentic wave of joy. And in the beginning, it was kind of almost like revenge against the people who had done harm against me. Like, I'm going to be happy despite you. Yeah. And, and so as it went on, that got to be more options and more freedom in myself to be happy because it's great. <laughs> right. And, and not just in, in reaction to, I'm not going to be an abuser. I'm not going to be somebody who's adding to the trauma of the world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be somebody who's adding to the beauty of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and then eventually when I had enough of my own healing, and it's not like I, you ever get tidy and done, but then I, I started noticing I could give it back for others. And that was really great to... It, it was a lot of, um, so much of my art, the first piece I did that was not just about me was really a relief. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all well and good to spend years and years kind of focused on self, but it's mm -hmm. great to open it up 
yeah. a little bigger. Yeah. What, when you're ready. And those years and years I did on just myself were essential. And, and then to start widening that circle a little bit was yeah. brought breath into it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then um, widening the circle bigger and widening the circle bigger. Mm -hmm. and, and who knows the ways and people it touches. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I have somebody, uh, my work's on Fine Art America, so I get to see who, who's viewed what image and where they're from. Mm -hmm. And for the past couple of weeks, there's somebody from the same city who looks at three images every day. Mm. And I don't know what it's doing for them. Like, I don't know, maybe they're doing like their morning prayer with it. Mm -hmm. or, but it's the same person looking at sometimes the same images. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And, and sometimes, maybe someday I'll get to meet that person and they'll tell me what their process has been. Mm -hmm. and, and in the meantime, I get to just make up my own fun story. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. And you were talking about um, the client that you had and you were saying that some people, you think that some people need to create mm -hmm. in a way that not everybody does. Um, what are your thoughts on like what is creativity and like what is um, it for? Where is it coming from and what is that sort of energetic body part that, mm -hmm. that artists have um, and what is it for? What's that the organic purpose of that? Mm -hmm. So we're all really here to connect and to and I think that's the piece that happens in different ways and so connection, belonging, like getting yourself reflected back, seeing another person, I find is what makes life really rich. Mm -hmm. And so, so for those of us who, like the visual art is part of that way to communicate. Mm -hmm. and, and there's been people where I felt like we didn't need to use sentences, we could just draw pictures and hand them back and forth to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and so whatever means that happens for people, and I'm also a rock climber, and so sometimes that process of connecting with the land and connecting with the rock, I'm, my life is in the hands of my blayer, or when I'm blaying, my life is, their life is in my hands. Like that immediacy and that kind of connection, mm -hmm. it's by whatever works for people, but just people who have got to find what brings them alive mm -hmm. and, and keep going again until you find it. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're doing something that isn't really doing it for you, if you're doing you know, jewelry making and, and it was serving you when you were 20, but you're 30 now, and now you're bored of it, try something else. Mm -hmm. Move to a next thing. And I have all these eras in my life of what, what my creative expression has been. Mm -hmm. and, and once I got out of school and I got to be in my own rhythm and find that I had my own seasons and rhythms, that was a really great thing because trying to do your creativity by an assignment and a date and somebody else's agenda, like I appreciate the training and good Lord, <laughs> talk about trying to like take this beautiful flowing thing and put it into little boxes. Right. I didn't think I was that creative until I got to, I got to Virginia Tech because mm -hmm. all my creativity had been through assignments and it was never big and spacious and juicy enough to hold what I had. Mm -hmm. So, so if you're doing the medium that isn't moving you to flow, try a different medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and structure too, like the medium is, is part of that. But yeah, what you're saying about timing, it's like imagine if you were saying to yourself like, okay, I have this memoir, I have one semester to do this <laughs> memoir, go. <laughs> and I see all kinds of things like that online. Write your memoir in six months or six weeks even. Like, oh, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. Because I had to metabolize this story. And my commitment to the reader is, I'm not going to give people my unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really tall order right there. And just that I committed to, I'm going to feel and process everything. First of all, because my writing is really a mess when I don't. <laughs> and, uh, but then if I can get to the making meaning part of it and yeah. give people that, Rather than, you know, there's some works out there, it's like people are just recycling their trauma. Yeah. And maybe that's useful to them, but I don't think it's a good idea to release it on a big scale for 
just re-triggering other people's trauma. Right. And that's the difference, I think, in what you're talking about, like your work, when you were working through your trauma and your anger, that was for you. And because you did that work, now you have something to actually offer other people. And that's art to be, to be seen and shared with others. Yes. Because so something's transformed, and so something can transform in them from looking at exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And again, it's about that connecting to people, connecting to life, connecting to nature. Mm-hmm. Like that's what... That's what brings me alive. Mm-hmm. And I see that in other, when people are lonely for themselves mm-hmm. and, and really needing to come home to themselves. And then they get to see all kinds of options that can k- keep that going. Mm-hmm. Mm, it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the more ways we can be that for each other, the better. Um, the, the retreat, Buddhist retreat I was talking about, um, Sakyang Mifam, he has such a, he has a great book and it really talks repeatedly about believing in the best in others and believing in the best in yourself and, mm-hmm. and believing that you're basically good mm-hmm. and looking for that in someone else might help them see it where they have forgotten it themselves. And we were talking about uh, dreaming big mm-hmm. and that I would rather dream big and get disappointed sometimes it didn't work out as I envisioned or worked out different or worked out better. Yeah. Yikes, that's scary. Then you have to take responsibility for it. Then then go through life dreaming small and having that be the disappointment at the end and like playing small. Yeah. And we were just like that constant limitation. Right, Mm -hmm. and that... And then I remember my, my mom standing in front of me, like, telling me not to be an artist. Mm-hmm. And I think somewhere she was trying to say, I don't want you to have to financially struggle or right. get She's rejection. You. Or, you know, but what she was saying was, don't live. Like, don't be yourself. And mm-hmm. it took me years to really recover from that. And uh, it was a moment where I, I made a music recording and I made a hundred duplications. And when I went to the company and I picked up the hundred duplications and I came home and I thought, I did it. I can trust myself to make my dreams come true. And that's how I'm gonna live. Mm -hmm. Is I'm just, I'm gonna step forward. Sometimes I don't know where and how or where exactly it's gonna turn out. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's projects that haven't gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's you know, some drawings that have been like, wow, that's just a frustrating drawing and a couple that I haven't finished and just let them go. Yeah, and disappointment is real. That dreaming big and then failing is is real and is possible. Yeah, fail well, (laughs) you know, do it all the way. Yeah. With uh, my husband's doing research on um, growth mindset Mm -hmm. versus, um, I always have trouble remembering the other side, rigid, structured, rigid mindset. And it's more of a safety mindset. Yeah. And what happens is that when people get, actually get some success, then they get rigid to hold on to it. Mm-hmm. And a growth mindset is about like, well, that worked pretty well. What can I do now? Oh, wow. And experienced business people expect their first three um, entrepreneurial projects to fail <laughs> so they can learn from it. And a great story I heard was a, uh, like a young man was part of a big company and he took some risk and he ended up losing the company like $100,000. And so he went into like the big CEO, CEO called him in and he was expected to be fired and humiliated. And the CEO said, well, what do you got next? He said, excuse me, sir. And he said, well, I just spent $100,000 to train you. <laughs> what you got next? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so that growth mindset is about is about being kind to yourself about uh, what did you fail well today? Mm-hmm. What did you struggle with and not master? Mm-hmm. Where did you where did you kind of try something out? Because you never know when that's going to come back in your process of ooh now I know that medium cannot do that because I pushed it too far. Yeah. And I, I think I remember once I was. I was, I really, I discovered fresh ginger and I was cooking with fresh ginger all the time and I pushed it too far. I'm like, how much fresh ginger can you put in before you actually ruin the meal and it's not edible? So find those edges out. Go too far. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And hopefully do it in, you know, 
I guess I hope it doesn't impact too many people. But if it does, you know. Yeah, and it's safer it's safer to explore that in art than yeah. in other ways. Yes. Because it, <laughs> you're not going to hurt too many people right. <laughs> figuring out how, how red is too red. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right. Does this neck smell? No, that's brown. Yuck, yuck. <laughs> and, and saying kind of like where the two processes go together, there was um, a time that I was rock climbing and what I love about rock climbing is sometimes I do something I didn't think I could do. And the first two years of climbing, I had to get past the ways that I cut myself short of success. Hmm. And so I watched myself. I would go for a hold and do a move. And then this like girl training would happen. You can't do that. You can't be that strong. Mm -hmm. you, you can't succeed in something physical. And, and I would miss because mm -hmm. this girl training came through. Mm -hmm. And so then I got mad. And so then I would like make these like karate, like I own that hole, that's mine. <laughs> and then that came back to my art. Mm. I was painting a, so I had done some rock climbing move that I totally didn't think I could do and I made it to the top and I was so proud of myself. And I think it was actually the next day I was painting a mandala on somebody's office wall and my medium's more color pencil so I'm not as skilled anymore at painting. And and with painting, like you have kind of one stroke, you know, to get it right in the mm -hmm. brush. It'll just be so rich if you can get it in one stroke. Mm -hmm. And I was partway through the stroke and I started to do like that. You can't do this. Yeah. You're going to fail. And I thought, nah, -uh. I got that rock climbing move. And I just trusted my hand and I went through and it came out totally graceful. Mm. And it was that shifting the self-talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how it actually, yeah, changes the brain and crosses over into relationships, hobbies, work, art, that, mm -hmm. that yeah, that self-talk can, sh can shift in one area of life and then really change mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to some brain research now that talks about when you keep those tracks going, then it's easier to go down them. So if you have a negative track going, yeah. you've wired neurons together in a, really quick pattern mm -hmm. and so it's easier to be in that negative thought pattern mm -hmm. yeah you like I know saw. that route mm -hmm. and so it's the same is true and so what I recommend to people is if you notice yourself in that violent self-talk stop pause take a deep breath do nothing for a moment don't try to fill it in with an affirmation mm -hmm. don't try and get yourself to a happy place just do nothing for a moment mm -hmm. And then over time, you've stopped doing that trench of a negative neural path. Right. That this leads to this. Dink, dink. <laughs> and, then, and then start to see, get curious about what else is possible. And it's not about making up like, oh, I'm the greatest artist ever. Because if you don't really feel that way, you're not being truthful yourself. Yeah. What if you say, I'm going to buy some paper today. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm going to buy a new medium. And I'm going to spend, you know, $35 on myself and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And not have a ton of pressure, not go for perfection, go for a mess. Mm -hmm. Go for a minor disaster on paper mm -hmm. and be delighted if something else happens. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, yeah, yeah. Well, I wanna wrap up and I was actually gonna ask you if you had suggestions for people who felt like inhibited or cautious, scared about starting things and um, like I think a lot of people feel compelled to be to express their creativity or they wish that they were more creative um, that they look at other people's artwork and think oh you know like I wish I could do that but for whatever reason it's like scary or inconvenient or uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, do you have you know one or two other little nuggets of wisdom um, have a space we have good lighting and you don't have other activities happening there. So you never have to clear off. If you get the spark of creativity, you don't have to go clear off your bills, you don't have to go clear off your taxes. Mm -hmm. You just have that space. I keep my, my drawing board tipped up, so I set nothing down on it. Mm -hmm. Like, I might have piles of paper elsewhere, but there are no piles on my desk, on my drawing table. Mm -hmm. So good lighting is the key. I have a 200 watt bulb to see what I'm doing. And um, start, if you're intimidated by it, go ahead and start with inexpensive materials. Draw, you know, get newsprint, whatever, it's $10, and just go through newsprint. 
And then as you're ready, warm up to higher quality materials. And then when you're ready, really do invest because you can get a better drawing sometimes by having higher quality materials. Mm -hmm. So, but just start where you are. If, you, if you're a social person, do it with somebody. If you need music on, do it that way. If you need total silence, do it that way. So figure out what makes you tick in your creativity, what makes you feel comfortable, and, and just start. And then try and um, figure out your mojo in it. Mm -hmm. Like I see things like, oh, you should write an hour a day. And I think, are you kidding me? <laughs> I need to write in like three-day blocks. Mm. Totally tire myself out and then not write for five days. Mm. And that's a year away. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I hear that like write for an hour or two hours a day. And I think I would be frustrated like heck. Mm -hmm. just when I get going. Mm -hmm. So yeah. honor, honor your process, honor your way. And good lighting, good space. Have people in your life know that that is your space. You know, and especially if you have kids, like, you know, something you can raise up or, yeah. you know, or if you want your kids to be involved, that's great too. But just figure out how you can have a spot where you don't have to set it up every mm -hmm. time. Or, you know, if you need to, you don't have a lot of space in your house, something you can open up and close up quickly. Right. But that's like dedicated creative space it's for not, you. It's not cold. It's not the dank corner. <laughs> like, don't give yourself the dregs. <laughs> So many people were like, my garage. Like, it's cold and moldy in there. in there. Yeah, that's not inspiring. <laughs> it smells bad in there. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Well, thank you so yeah. much for being here. I'm, I feel so inspired and just wowed by you. So thank you so I'm much for being here. by you. <laughs> you? Yeah. I adore you. I adore you too. Thank you so much for sharing. I, it was, yeah, it was really, really awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for watching and remember to like, share, and subscribe. We want as many people as possible to find out about the inspiring artists who come on Art Kitchen. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash mogoldenvideos, and you can find and support this project at patreon.com slash mo. Brewing in the shade.